this moment. Thank you so much for joining us. I am here today talking Diablo 2 Resurrected with Rod Ferguson. Rod, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks. I'm excited to be here. And I'm excited to talk about Diablo 2. I played the alpha. I loved it. I cannot wait to get into the full game. Uh, one of the main questions I have, though, is about the graphics. So you made it so that you can quickly swap between the graphics how difficult was that to get implemented and like why don't you just tell me a little bit more about the process of designing in that way yeah i mean the big thing was really about we wanted to make sure that the game was authentic to the original and so we this is a remaster not a remake and the way that we did the remaster was underneath the surface the actual engine that's driving the game is the original game that that 2d sprite game that you know and love is under there making all the did you hit the monster what loot should fall all those sorts of things and so what we've done is we've created a layer on top and which is this 4k hd layer with dolby surround sound and those sorts of things and so you know in some ways it was hard to have that but in another way because the game is underneath the surface switching between our hd layer and the game that's running underneath was actually relatively straightforward and the big reveal today is that we have a date september 23rd the game's going to have cross progression. There's a beta in August on PlayStation, Xbox, PC, where you're adding the Druid and Paladin for the first time. How do I get in as soon as humanly possible to play more Diablo 2? <laughs> Uh, well, there's two ways to get in. As part of our announce, uh, you know, for the date, we're also starting pre-orders on console. And so uh, anybody who's pre-ordered on PC and console will have the opportunity to get into the early access beta in August. And then after that will be an open beta. So if you want to get in as early as possible, all you have to do is pre-order. You know, uh, I love taking a look at the technology, especially on the consoles you have. We, we're in this time where you got the PS5, the Xbox Series X, the Xbox Series S, and then all the consoles that came before that. So what are your targets on the the, cons the older consoles, we'll call them, and then the new consoles? Can you tell us more about the tech specs there? Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't have them all like written out here exactly, but like our goal is on the latest and greatest is to get to the, that 4K um, you know, and trying to push to 60 frames and, and those sorts of things. I think what's interesting with the technology is just like how much is actually there. Like the fact that you have eight player co-op, you know, that was something that hasn't been around in a while. Um, and so bringing from, you know, the fact that a feature that existed 21 years ago is actually going to be somewhat new and interesting in, in 21 years later uh, is kind of fun. But you've got eight necromancers creating, you know, lots and lots of skeletons. It can definitely push the system. So, yeah, but we're really focused on making sure that it's the best, like the original was 800 by 600 2D. And like I said, we're really trying to push to this 4K 60 that we can have on, on and sort of the top of the line consoles and PC. So like when you're developing and testing this on consoles, you're testing it on PC, how does having those two engines running at the same time, the old one, which is your base, as you said, and the new one that you can swap to on the fly at any time, how do you test that and make sure that both are working well at the same time? Yeah, it's well, it's been great in, in the sense that we're, you know, because we're so focused on parity, you know, that again, trying to be as authentic as possible, that we can kind of just keep flipping back and forth and understanding, okay, how do we think about, you know, are the things in the right place? And oh, I'm running some weird collision in HD that, oh, when I switch to SD, I can see oh, there's something in the way and we don't have that represented correctly. And and you do have to do that testing because, you know, the original game ran on a much lower frame rate. And so where like modern games run on time and, and sort of the 20 years ago, you were running on frames. You can't do that anymore because you can get the frame count so high, it causes the simulation to sort of break. And so you have to kind of work between this sort of translation layer between something that's running on, you know, a certain number of frames a second versus, okay, how do I run on time so that the events click at the right place? And so it's been a lot of engineering around knowing if you hit, knowing if this animation played at the right time, whether, you know, certain things miss and that, all those sorts of things. So it's, there's been a lot of work to go through that translation of going, okay, a frame-based engine and now a time-based rendering engine for the HD. Uh, it's, it, there's been a lot of complexities to that, um, but it, it, it's working really well. And, and it, it feels great both on PC and on console and being able to play with the controller. Yeah. So you brought up being able to have these these big collaborative battles, so to speak, where you just kind of go through and clear the map with a bunch of your friends. Uh, what has that been like during playtesting? Like, what has the reaction been that you've seen 
from the community or just from people playing the game internally at the studio? Yeah, for the multiplayer stuff, we've only been able to test it so far, you know, within the team and such. Like the alpha we did uh, earlier was a single player alpha and the response to that was fantastic. And in fact, it was kind of really what allowed us to have confidence in our date because, you know, when, when you're bringing sort of this beloved game uh, and making it feel modern and contemporary, you're making decisions around what should you leave the same for authentic reasons and what should you change because you want it to be contemporary like hey maybe if we had a shared stash where you could share equipment across characters which didn't exist or having auto gold pickups so that you don't have to click on every piece of gold you know those are decisions that we as a team are making hoping like okay let's not mess it up like you have this amazing experience and that's the <laughs> joy of doing a remaster is you know it's fun you know it's an amazing game so don't screw it up as you try to modernize it and make it feel contemporary with the you know modern visuals and so it was really trying to find that balance. And so what the alpha showed us in terms of the feedback that we received from players is that like for the most part, we, we, we nailed it. Like we, we found a really good groove on what we wanted to accomplish with that game. And so uh, that really gave us the confidence to be like, okay, that, you know, now we can focus on you know, understanding that feedback and reacting to it, but also like let's go to the next stage in terms of giving people that multiplayer experience as well. And so that allowed us to feel confident about where we are and why we have the September 23 day. So was that idea of keeping the original feel, so to speak, was that something you landed on from the get go? Like when you were in initial concepting and planning and everything, were you just like, we have to keep it as close to the original as possible with these really minor improvements? Yeah, it's it, that was the big thing. Like it, it's Diablo 2 sort of set a bar and kind of helped establish what is the uh, action role playing genre. Right. And so you don't want to mess with that. And that's even when we looked at the balancing, people were saying like, hey, if you're going to remaster the game, why don't you change the balancing of the classes or the balances of the skills? And it was just, it felt like we have to be careful because then it's not that same experience. And so again, like everything we did, we sort of did with a, in a measured way of like, okay, are we fundamentally changing how the game plays or how it feels? Um, and versus are we making sort of your experience better without doing that. And so again, as we made individual choices, like, like take one of the things about a game, like from 21 years ago, is that there's a lot more discovery, you know, and a lot more things that weren't explained to you. And so when you get a quest in Diablo 2, you got to go find it. <laughs> like you got to, okay, it says go to the, the monastery and you're like, I don't even know where the monastery is. So I'm going to go out and start adventuring and start moving through the maps until I discover the monastery. Whereas a modern game would put a, like a little arrow on your map and say, go here, that's the monastery. And, you know, and that felt like, sure, that's a convenience and, and a quality of life improvement for some players, but it kind of takes away the essence. And same thing with sort of inventory Tetris, you know, the inventory space in D2 is very small and, people are all like, oh, you know, like, what about a charm bag so we can put all our charms somewhere else? And what if we may increase the inventory size and all these sorts of things? And what you realize is that actually that constraint around your tiny inventory is is a, a big part of what makes the game work in terms of some of the things you have to think about or what you're picking up and what you're not. And that, that Tetris is kind of a big part of the experience of playing. And, you know, we, for a while we had an auto sort button and, and as soon as it went in, you immediately realize that, no, that doesn't work at all. Uh, and it takes away some part of the, what's core to playing the game. Yeah. I just want to call it one of the big things about we we're really excited about with the trailer that we were able to show at E3 uh, was really getting to see the cinematic or a sneak peek at what the cinematics are. So, you know, one of the things we talked about is the game is a remaster. Uh, we felt like the, the game, you know, again, it's a legendary game. Uh, we wanted to make sure that the storytelling and the cinematic quality matched kind of the, the game. It, it deserved more than a 4K up res or an AI up res uh, from, of 20 year old cinematics. And so we went in and uh, we partnered with our story and franchise development team. They call SFD at Blizzard. They're responsible for all those amazing CG cinematics. And we partnered with a company called Access and, and they, we worked together to take the story shot for shot when we make uh, all the cinematics. So 27 minutes of, of amazing CG cinematics where you get to see sort of Maris's journey and following the Dark Wanderer. And you got to see a little taste of that at, uh, at E3 and uh, we can't wait to show more. So Rod, your career, you've worked on some, you know, major franchises. What has it have been, what has it been like for you jumping into the Diablo franchise? Are there any techniques across the different games you're working on, like Diablo 2 that are being utilized in Diablo 4? Really, I'm fishing for anything about Diablo 4 that you could tease, <laughs> but um, yeah, feel free to elaborate on that. It's a good bridge. I'm glad you know, it was and nice of you to tell me what you're doing, going for there. <laughs> um, uh, two things. I mean, one is like from a, 
sort of going from leading, you know, the Gears of War franchise to now leading the Diablo franchise, uh, it's definitely been different for in a couple ways. One is, uh, you know, when I was part of Gears, I joined uh, Epic in 2005, and I was part of really Gears from the very beginning. I was, I pretty much had a hand in shipping all versions of Gears, and at some point, I kind of became, you know, I was the creative director up at the Coalition as well as the studio head, and. Uh, I, I knew, like, when you had a question about Gears of War, you come to me and I can tell you the answer. I, I knew the lore, I helped create the lore, and, and those sorts of things. Um, coming into Diablo, which is one of my favorite franchises ever, and it's been around for 25 years, like this December will be the 25th anniversary for D1. Um, and even though I was an avid player and I loved it, like, I'm still not, like, I don't have the depth of knowledge that a creator would have. And so I've really had to come in as a student and not as a teacher uh, as in, in that way. Um, and then the other is really just sort of the pandemic. I mean, made the decision to like, you know, move from Vancouver and start a whole new journey with my family and, and work on a new franchise. And uh, I had eight days in the office before the pandemic really hit and we started work from home. And so for the last 15 months that I've been uh, the executive producer for the franchise, I've been doing it through calls like this. And so trying to lead a team and multiple teams, because we've got, you know, Diablo 3 and Diablo 2R, we've got Diablo Immortal and Diablo 4, like helping to to guide those teams and, and work with them. Uh, it's been really interesting to have to do through, um, you know, through a, through a video camera and a monitor. Um, but to go to your fishing for D4 information, I mean, the thing I can say is, you know, one of the things we did after we announced D4 is we really wanted to keep um, all the players invested in the game and understanding the kind of decisions we were making and, and include them on the journey. And so we were doing quarterly blog updates and uh, even we did sort of a video blog update at BlizzCon, if you will. So our next one is coming. So uh, it's coming at the end of June and it'll really be focused around the characters and the character art. So we're really excited about having another blog update and, and keeping people up to, up to date with what we're doing with D4. Wow. Uh, well, that's great to hear. I'm happy that I got a little bit of something about Diablo 4. <laughs> You'll see more, and I promise. Great, great. And I am truly, really excited about Diablo 2. Thank you, and thank you to the team for all the work that you put in on that game. Elden Ring, emboldened by the flame of ambition, someone must extinguish thy flame. They will fight, and they will die.
brandish the Elden Ring. For all of us. I am so proud of you. Do you know what a birthright is, Peter? Something that's a part of you. Like your name. Gardeners of the Galaxy? What? No, Rocket. So I let Groot fill out the paperwork. So we got fined. We appear to be 6,963 units short. I know, we clearly need a plan. If you see anything with claws inside the tracks, let me know. We got this. Drax, roll. No! Disrobe! Keep your pants on. Although it could be used as a distraction. Smash him up, Dredd! Make your maker! We're all professionals here, right? Maybe we can work something out. Peter! You had one job, Quill. I did exactly what! Come on, no killing teammates! That's who! It's literally in your contract! I made no such commitments. In less than three cycles, all would be lost. The galaxy cannot be saved, Peter Quill. We can do this together! Fucking uh, great, Quill! These things, where do they come from? From all of us. From what we do to him. Can you stop it? I don't know. But he's my brother. 
and I would die for him. Play it day one with Xbox Game Pass. You have shown an aptitude for applying lethal solutions to conflicted situations. We wish to test your abilities. stories, memorable characters, and vibrant gameplay are in store as you lead the commanding officers to victory. Play the first two Advance Wars campaigns in Advance Wars 1 Plus 2 Reboot Camp. Marching on to Nintendo Switch this holiday. Pre-orders begin today on Nintendo eShop. What's up, everybody? IGN Executive Editor of Commerce and proud U.S. Air Force Senior Airman Seth Macy here to break down all of the biggest announcements, trailers, and news from IGN's Summer of Gaming. Did you miss something? I got you covered. This is IGN's coverage of the coverage presented by USAA Insurance. USAA serves military members and their families. With their unique understanding of their members' needs, USAA Insurance provides proactive service and exceptional products. As a proud member of USAA for over 20 years, I can safely say USAA Insurance makes it easy to protect the things you care about. But now, let's get to the news. Nintendo kicked off their Direct with yet another Smash fakeout that saw Tekken's Kazuya Mishima drop the incapacitated bodies of other Smash fighters into a volcano. That's right, the angry man from Tekken is joining Super Smash Brothers. For those with a fondness for monkeys trapped inside rolling balls, rejoice! Super Monkey Ball Banana Mania features remakes of Super Monkey Ball, Super Monkey Ball 2, and Super Monkey Ball Deluxe, and it releases this October 5th. One of the Direct's biggest surprises was the announcement of Metroid Dread. This is a title that was originally in development for the Nintendo DS and was long thought canceled. But hey, it's back. It's coming to Nintendo Switch October 8th of this year. The trailer shows off fancy new armor for Samus, a new nemesis that will stalk her around and be very scary. So like think Boston Dynamics dog crossed with GLaDOS from Portal, but more agile. The announcement also came with the acknowledgement that yes, Metroid Prime 4 is still in development. <laughs> Speaking of surprises, everyone's favorite nasty man is back with a collection of new games. 
WarioWare Get It Together features two-player co-op and Wario speaking in full sentences. Unsettling, to say the least. After that, they resurrected the GBA classic Advance Wars with Advance Wars 1 and 2 Reboot Camp. It's a Switch collection of the first two games with entirely new graphics. Nintendo also announced a ton of other things, including Shin Megami Tensei 5, but yo, yeah, let's just get to what everyone is waiting for. Last but not least, it finally happened. We got more Breath of the Wild 2 footage. We saw Link free falling out of the sky in a new outfit and a new Sheikah arm. That fancy little arm looks like it's replacing the Sheikah slate because we get glimpses of Link using stasis on some spiky boulders. The game's got a whole lot going on, and honestly, I'm probably just gonna rewatch the trailer for like the millionth time as soon as I finish this video. And that does it for today's coverage of the coverage. What did you think of all the announcements? Let us know in the comments below. And remember, USAA makes it easy to cover your rigs and gaming gear. Make sure you've got the right coverage with USAA Insurance. Membership eligibility and product restrictions apply and are subject to change. Property and casualty insurance provided by United Services Automobile Association and its affiliate property and casualty insurance companies is available only to persons eligible for PNC Group membership. Each company has sole financial responsibility for its own products. What's up, everybody? I'm Damon Hatfield. Welcome to a very special live episode of Game Scoop here on IGN Summer of Gaming. E3 may be in the rear view, but the summer continues with our Pride stream this Friday, the EA Play event on July 22nd, and Gamescom in August, plus whatever surprises pop up in between. We'll be covering it all, and you can find our Summer of Gaming coverage pretty much anywhere at IGN.com, on YouTube, across social media, or even on your smart TV. Without further ado, my guests today are Lucy O'Brien from Podcast Beyond. Beyond, hello. Miranda Sanchez from Podcast Unlocked. Hi, hello, welcome everyone. And Zach Ryan from Nintendo Voice Chat. Greetings. Greetings, everybody. What's up, everybody? <laughs> first things first, let's talk about Xbox. Now, going into E3, Xbox had a lot to prove. The Series X is here. It's a great console, but looking down the road, we weren't really sure what we were going to be playing on it through the rest of this year and into 2022. Now we know Xbox showed a lot of games, a lot of exclusives, and a lot coming to Game Pass day one. Miranda, what did you think of the Xbox E3 showcase this year? going to be honest, um, just a tiny bit disappointed that we didn't get a new Fusion Frenzy announcement. But <laughs> <laughs> in all seriousness, though, uh, I think they did a fantastic job. Uh, the pacing of the showcase was just what they needed. We knew certain things were going to be there. Like, they had to give an update on Halo Infinite, right? Like, that was yeah. an obvious expected thing. Um, Bethesda, they were not going to not show Starfield. So those were just things we knew were going to be on the dock. Um, and so for me, I needed Xbox to come out and give that one more thing. That was not those two. 
those those two games could not close the show because they have mm. still more to prove, right? They've acquired all of these different studios. Uh, they have all these exclusives that they're trying to flaunt. But I need to know what's coming like soon and what's happening um, that we should be excited for. And they really did show that, I think, in this press conference. Lucy, what did you think while you while you were watching the throw sh the show through your PlayStation goggles? <laughs> Look. I have an Xbox as well, and I love my Xbox. And I think I, I agree with Miranda that there was a, a lot on the table. There was a lot to prove uh, this year. And I think Xbox came out, absolutely, to use a terrible cliche, absolutely swinging. Um, I think that Game Pass, as I said this on um, last week's episode of Next Gen Console Watch, I think Game Pass is, is, is making the Xbox an unmissable sort of infrastructure right now mm. i think everything that we saw at this show and so many of them coming to game pass day one uh was really impressive um you know it's kind of up to sony to step up its game right now uh that that's frank frankly i was just really impressed and um i'm pleased also that xbox is really focusing on exclusives as well i, I say that with my heart and my mm. shoes because no starfield for for playstation players um, but you know, Xbox has needed exclusives for a while and now they've got them. It is true. Sony, um, has been pretty quiet in the midst of all these announcements. We'll talk a little bit about what we expect, uh, to see from Sony next a little bit later in the show. Everyone seems to agree that Microsoft had a good showing this year. Uh, Zach, do you count yourself among, uh, among that camp? Yeah. I, you know, we always talk every year, everybody does about who, who won a three. Um, which presentation, you know, ended up at the top of the list. And I honestly think it was the Xbox this year. I think Microsoft's presentation was phenomenal. I think they showed off a lot of new stuff. I think they gave uh, pertinent updates on a lot of stuff that we knew was coming. And like Lucy said, not to belabor the fact, but um, Game Pass is by far and away the best deal in gaming right now. If you are a casual gamer and you want to pick up an Xbox Series S and Game Pass, I mean hundreds of games at your fingertips like it, mm -hmm. it it's mm -hmm. such a good deal and i think leaning into that especially having all their new stuff day one on on game pass is such a smart call i, I think xbox really blew me away this year let's dive into halo infinite uh with a little bit more depth halo infinite was supposed to be out in the wild for over six months now it was supposed to be a launch game with the series x of course um it had a big campaign reveal last summer that received mixed uh reception Following that, it was delayed into the fall of 2022. But I think, Miranda, I think everyone seems, at least at least the Halo fans, seem really happy with what they saw in the, in the showcase, especially from the multiplayer. I'd, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts as me as a more casual player, mm -hmm. uh, someone who probably would only play the campaign. I was a little disappointed that we didn't get an updated look at the camp campaign. But what were your, th your thoughts? Uh, as a like big Halo fan, like I, I regularly play through that series, like replay those games. I think I've only played Halo uh, at least like the first one at least four or five times all the way through. Not if more, probably more. Um, anyway, but as far as the reveal goes, I, I think focusing on multiplayer made a lot of sense because we have a sense of what we're gonna get with the campaign in, in terms of Master Chief's next story, and I could see them maybe saying like, okay. We have a, a limited time for this press conference. What are we going to show? We will do a small reel for the multiplayer, or like a small reel, excuse me, a longer reel for the multiplayer, which is what we haven't shown yet, and then a quick segment for the campaign, which is what we're seeing right now. And I think that gave us enough context for the story of like, oh, well, what happened with Cortana? Like, what's going on next in the story? Um, and just kind of like updating what we already know and adding more information without giving us too much. Uh, I do hope that they have even some extra event between now and fall just to kind of revisit the campaign and really show off like, hey, here's all the improvements we've been making. Um, I think it was smart of them to just, again, focus on the new thing. Like, let's talk about multiplayer. It's going to be free to play. It's a big deal that you can just download it. You don't have to buy Halo. It doesn't matter if you have Game Pass. Just download multiplayer. Yeah. It's going to be cool. Um, and honestly, I am so glad that they also took time to do an extra multiplayer, like kind of dev walkthrough video after mm -hmm. the fact as well. Um, and this kind of goes to, back to my earlier point about Microsoft just doing such a great job of pacing their show. Like, of course, someone like me, I want all the details about multiplayer. I want to know everything. However, like Dane and people like you maybe don't necessarily need the deep dive and that kind sure. of slows down the conference, right? And so I think they just did a stellar job of making sure they gave just enough information 
for, especially for those people who were more interested in something while not holding up the rest of the show. So I was really pleased with what they showed, especially again, after the fact, but I like you would also like more information on the campaign because I'm excited about it. So, mm -hmm. Well, Lucy, of course, Sony has no shortage of exclusive games, but Halo represents something Sony doesn't really have, which is just, you know, a triple A caliber first person shooter. Uh, is the Halo series something that you follow and what did you think of what you saw at the showcase this year? I mean, I, I will say that I thought it was really impressive. Halo is a is a blind spot for me. I'll be mm -hmm. completely honest. Like I, I never really played Halo. Um, so I can only speak to the sort of f general fan reaction that I saw from this multiplayer reveal, which to me looked really impressive. Mm -hmm. um, but people seem really stoked. And again, you know, I just want to echo everything that Miranda said, like it was just the perfect amount of a teaser. Like we got a lot of new information from that teaser, but it was, it did not belabor the, the point. It did not outstay its welcome. Um, and again, it really seems like that extra time has been absolutely worth it. So, you know, the conversation has gone from Halo Infinite is in a really diff like troubled place to Halo Infinite is looking really, really cool. Mm -hmm. Do you agree, Zach? Mm -hmm. Would you consider yourself excited for Halo Infinite? Uh, yeah, similarly to Lucy, you know, I, Series X is my first Xbox that I've owned outright. I've completely missed the entire Halo series. Um, and Honestly, the more I see of Halo Infinite, the more I'm like, I need to go back and play through these games. I have the do Master it. Chief collection. It is on Game Pass. Like, I do, I do feel inspired to go through <laughs> and, and get a taste of what everybody has been so excited about for two decades, you know, while I've been playing PlayStation and, and Nintendo games. Mm -hmm. Kind of from that point, too, like, honestly, it makes me sad that, like, I'm kind of reverse. I, my first PlayStation console was a PlayStation 2 that I bought specifically just for Kingdom Hearts. Like, I was a small mm -hmm. child. I was like, I want Kingdom Hearts. Um, and I really do wish that Sony would match Microsoft in doing something like Game Pass so I could revisit those old classics like you guys can do with Master Chief. Also, if you guys want to play Halo, let me know. I'll walk you through it. <laughs> please be, right a, please, be our sure. guide, Miranda. We, we need it. Happily. Miranda will carry you. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the biggest net announcements out of all of E3 was Starfield. We got a release date, um, confirmation that it is definitely an Xbox console exclusive. Uh, Miranda, we know now it's basically Skyrim in space. That tells me all that I need to know. Were you, were you surprised to finally have confirmation that it's definitely an Xbox exclusive? No, I was absolutely okay. not surprised. Um, it just just made sense like you don't spend all that money for it to not be exclusive like mm -hmm. that doesn't that doesn't make sense so yeah. <laughs> um yeah like i think that they're going to be like i think microsoft is doing a good job so far as like maintaining games that have been released on other platforms that they acquired later like especially with mojang and minecraft like that's just mm -hmm. been a long-standing thing um and they won't like pull things off However, Starfield never had that, like, here's where everything's going to be. And I guess if also you really don't want to buy an Xbox for whatever reason, like, you still have the PC option. Like, that's going to be another thing. So, you know, it just made sense to me. Yeah. Is, it, is Starfield something that you're excited for? Yeah, absolutely. I love the approach that they had with the design here. I think it gives like a, I know they're trying to hit more of a realistic look at space and it looks more near future than it does like say mm -hmm. Mass Effect, right? Where it's just so intensely sci-fi that it's unreachable. Yeah. Uh, but this looks like something's like, oh, well this this could be a future. And, and I kind of like how in a way Fallout feels like that, even though obviously not. But, yeah. you know, it, it just feels grounded in a very specific way, but with just touches of fantasy that make it, I think, just the perfect amount of fun. So uh, it seems like Starfield's aiming for that as well. And mm -hmm. I like that sandwich as much as everyone else did, I think, too. So, Well, the Xbox cool exclusivity might be frustrating, uh, especially for some PlayStation owners. And in fact, Bethesda's Pete Hines ended up issuing some some sort of an apology, acknowledging at least that frustration. Lucy, what do you, do you, would you say you feel that frustration? I know you said you own an Xbox Series X, but. Yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, I want people who just own uh, a PlayStation 5 to get as many games as they feasibly can. That console is not cheap. Um, and it's also a, a, a wonderful console. Um, but, you know, I'm also not surprised. This is a uh, smart business. Um, it is, it's, it's a bummer. Um, but it's smart on on the Xbox side of things. I, I, you know, I, I don't feel like Pete was, you know, apologizing for the exclusiveness. I feel like he's always been a kind of more approachable. Uh, yeah. You know, they call him Uncle Pete, right? 
like he's an approachable kind of dude and i sort of get what he was going for in that interview he was just like i'm I, i'm sorry this sucks you know well, it's not he, it was it was not an apology for the for the deal it was just like yeah. i i recognize that this sucks yeah he clarified that statement on twitter too he went out and said like hey i was apologizing for people's frustrations not yeah. that we're exclusive to xbox because obviously they're beholden to Microsoft at this point. Like, you know, like yeah. uh, it's totally Microsoft's decision where they where they're allowed to publish those games. And so, yeah, I think it's it's not surprising that this is an exclusive. And I think that that his apology was, um, you know, it, it totally made sense to me. Like, yeah, it is frustrating for games to be exclusive when they've previously been, uh, you know, a multi-platform uh, developer and publisher. And I appreciated his candidness, right? Like, mm -hmm. it's kind of rare that you see that in communications departments and like i'm not so i'm unsurprised that it made headlines but like mm -hmm. i appreciated it mm -hmm. so skyrim in space zach does that something sound like something you want to play well i love skyrim and i yeah. love space so yeah i'm into that and I, I i you know like miranda said i love the retro uh or not the retro future but like this near future feel um it seems to me like this story is kind of be gonna maybe be something about humanity looking for the next you know like era the next place to go and like I, mm -hmm. that is also something that i'm very interested in exploring and i just think bethesda makes really great games and um you know i'm excited to check this one out yeah and apparently that this trailer is all running in engine too so mm -hmm. That's it nuts. should give us a pretty yeah. good hint at what the game is actually going to look like which is very right. exciting but now microsoft's one more thing at the end of the conference was surprisingly enough something new from arcane uh, Dishonored developers and a studio that already has Deathloop coming up very soon. The one more thing was Redfall and Miranda, I think you're very excited about this one. Is that right? Ecstatic. Oh my goodness, guys. This is just, I, I love Arcane. I love Dishonored. It's one of my favorite yeah. game series just ever. Uh, I think Prey was fantastic. I love their stories and just how they design their games. I'm like a big Bioshock fan. And like, basically if you have a gun in one hand, powers in the other, mm. it's first person, I'm here for it. And Arcane just does such a fantastic job with those kinds of games. And seeing this, <laughs> oh man, like obviously we didn't actually get to see any gameplay. And I think there's a lot of speculation of like, what is this? Is it a looter shooter? Is it like Destiny? It's like, guys, this is Arcane. This is Arcane, it's not gonna be that. Um, which they did later confirm on their website uh, for Redfall that sort of announced that this is going to be an open world first person shooter you have the option for multiplayer and you get to play as one of the characters they have since announced. I have a hunch that they're probably gonna announce more characters based on mm. like some of the wording and phrasing of like how they've positioned who you get to play as. Um, and you're fighting vampires yeah. and there's like magic and it's fantastic. The tone of this trailer was so fun too. And I think with vampires, like you, you always rock a weird line, right? Like, are you gonna go for that super gothic horror are you like rocking the sexy vampire who's just like super powerful, but also just looks like a normal human? I like in this one, you get these vampires and they're just intimidating as heck and they're so monstrous, but also really cool. And so mm -hmm. they just nailed so many aspects of this reveal for me. Um, and again, like having been a big fan of arcane games, I knew, I kind of know what to expect as far as like what the gameplay is. Like, I know that's going to mm. be solid. So I'm, I'm really excited. I'm letting myself be super excited. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I think that uh, it's also of note to point out that you know, this is Xbox's one more thing. Like you know, mm -hmm. historically, that's the biggest and you know brightest reveals come at the end of the show. And I just think it's awesome to live in an era where that's an arcane game. You know, arcane. We talked about it a little bit in in our uh, setup before we got started here, but um, Arcane has always been a, a critical darling, but not necessarily like a smashing commercial success. And uh, I just think it's awesome that Xbox, uh, Microsoft gave them the limelight at the end of their presentation and said, here's something that we're really proud of and really looking forward to, and you should be excited as well. Yeah, it's interesting to think about how long Redfall has been in development and could mm -hmm. it have been something that caught Microsoft's eye and helped convince them to make the purchase of Bethesda? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Lucy, I think uh, I think you're also a big Arcane fan. I think you you were saying before we started uh, this live stream that you thought Dishonored Two was one of the best games ever made. So are you excited for Redfall? I did. I I still believe that. I reviewed Dishonored Two for IGN back in the day. I gave it a nine point three when we still had that kind of a scale. Um, on ref reflection, could have probably these days given it a ten. Um, mm. But look, I I I'm so I sort of want to echo what what Zach said. I have been always a little bit worried about arcane because like their games haven't necessarily been commercial successes mm -hmm. um and 
I think that this is one of the best things to come out of this Bethesda acquisition is that Arcane is finally getting put into the spotlight that they deserve. They're one of the most clever, forward thinking, lateral thinking, um, bizarre developers working today. And I'm just so excited that finally more people are paying attention to them because, you know, as Zach said, it's the one big thing at the end of the Xbox show. Mm -hmm. It's like, yes, this is the developer to pay attention to. And I think Redfall looks absolutely wonderful. Yeah, it's really exciting stuff. There were a ton of games shown off during Microsoft conference. A lot more we could talk about, although we're running out of time. We want to make sure we have time to talk about Nintendo and PlayStation and all the third-party stuff. But Psychonauts 2 is just around the corner. A uh, very cool-looking game called Replaced 2.5D. Cinematic platformer was just announced. I know that a lot of people are really excited for that one. But right now, it's time for a quick break. We'll be right back with more GameScoop Live and the latest from Nintendo and Square Enix. Stick around. IGN Summer of Gaming is powered by Duracell Optimum. All summer long, we're bringing you the game announcements, developer interviews, and all the demos you care about. So get comfortable and get ready to play. Upgrade your Logitech mouse with Duracell Optimum batteries today. Not only is IGN the world's biggest media brand for games and entertainment, but we also have a team of some of the world's biggest fans of your favorite franchises. From breaking news and exclusives, never before seen looks at movies and games, to reviews, let's plays, and live streams, IGN brings you all the coverage you need, no matter where you are. Whether you're on IGN.com, the IGN app, YouTube, Facebook, or Snapchat, we've always got you covered. IGN, the number one source for all games and entertainment fans worldwide. Everybody loves watching a speed run of their favorite game, but what if you got a chance to peek into the mind of the developers behind those games as they watch their hard work get completely destroyed right in front of them? What is happening right now? That's exactly what happens on every episode of Devs React to Speedruns. We invite you to ride along with the developers as they watch, react, and enjoy some of the craziest gameplay by the most skilled speedrunners on the planet. Tune in every Saturday for a brand new episode. In a world with non-stop news about Marvel, DC, Star Wars, you need a show with accurate reporting, hard-hitting commentary, and... Me, Akeem Lawanson, host of IGN's news show, The Fix Entertainment. Whether it's the latest superhero scoop, film fiasco, or anime announcement, I'll be here covering all the breaking movie, TV, and streaming news that matters most to you. Make sure to catch The Fix Entertainment on IGN for your fix of entertainment news. Let's drop it. Welcome back, everyone. This is GameScoop Live, and I'm your host, Damon Hatfield. Right now, we are talking about the biggest hits out of the Nintendo Direct, and of course, the most epic of them all. What's the kicker? A teaser for Breath of the Wild Part 2. Uh, Zach, what did you think yeah. of Nintendo's E3 Direct this year? I personally loved it. I, you know, I think it was a pretty dichotomous direct. I think, mm -hmm. I think they're, they're, you know, I saw a lot of people celebrating uh, what Nintendo showed off, and I saw a lot of people being like, "That's it. That's all you got." I, I <laughs> at the risk of sounding a little bit gatekeepy, I think that this was a direct for like hardcore Nintendo fans. They showed a lot of like really great B tier stuff, mm -hmm. um, and then of course Breath of the Wild too, which everyone is excited for. Uh, uh, me especially. Um, I've got Breath of the Wild going on in the background here, but. Cool. Um, yeah, I thought it was really solid. I loved that they, they are bringing back a couple of old franchises like WarioWare and uh, Advanced Wars. And then, you know, new stuff too, like this new Breath of the Wild game. Um, yeah, I, I, as a Nintendo fan, it spoke to me. And I was, I was really, really into what they were showing off. That's an interesting observation uh, that it was probably more aimed at hardcore fans because you're right, big 
titles like Animal Crossing and Pokemon were missing from mm -hmm. this year's Direct. Um, mm -hmm. But lots, lots for people like us to enjoy. Miranda, mm -hmm. what did you think of the Nintendo E3 Direct? I felt like they were good announcements, but many of them were maybe not for me. So for instance, here Advance Wars, I've never played that. Don't really care about it. I know a lot of people are really excited about Metroid. Also not really my thing. Um, though I can appreciate that people were really excited for it. Um, however, I did, or I was really happy to see WarioWare. I love WarioWare. I love, I think they're just like the perfect bite-sized mini games. It's such a fun time. Um, and I was happy to see a new Mario Party release with just, it's like, let's just bring back the classics. It's gonna have multiplayer at launch. It's gonna work, hopefully. <laughs> um, there's a way to like save your progress if you're playing online, which um, that's a big thing for me and my siblings. So it's like, okay, cool. I, I like that a lot. And then of course, Breath of the Wild. And those are pretty much the three things that were big for me. Um, and, you know, Breath of the Wild was another one of those, like, we kind of expect it to be shown off, right? Like, mm -hmm. it's got to be soon, so there's got to be something. So I was glad to see that as well. And Lucy, was there enough in the Nintendo Direct to get you excited? Definitely. I mean, I would call myself a more casual uh, Nintendo fan, uh, but obviously Breath of the Wild 2, you know, Breath of the Wild, I think, is is in the top three games of, of you know, this last generation. Uh even though the Nintendo Switch is, is, has not yet had a successor. Um, I think that the sequel is just so exciting. And, you know, judging from my Twitter, there was something for seemingly everyone in this direct who, who oh. likes Nintendo. I mean, <laughs> every, thing? everyone seemed extremely, uh, you know, psyched over games that, as Miranda said, I don't really necessarily care about um but you know there was a lot of like furious excited exciting typing uh as these games were announced and i think uh at the end of it like it was a really successful show it wasn't as breathtaking as xbox's but i would say that this mm. was definitely the second best uh conference at e3 this year Mm -hmm. Let's dive a little bit into Breath of the Wild 2. Um, what they showed wasn't a huge amount, but there was enough to tease and get people excited and definitely enough to uh, start sparking some wild theories about who we're going to be playing as in this game and exactly when it's set. Zach, uh, it's not coming until next year. Um, so how would, you, how would you gauge your sort of excitement for Breath of the Wild 2 right now? Uh, I mean, Breath of the Wild, uh, the original is my favorite game of all time. Uh, I've played it multiple times. I, I, I love it so, so much. I think it's damn near a perfect video game. So I honestly, like Breath of the Wild 2 is at the top of my list for games that I'm most excited about. I am disappointed that it's not coming this year. I've long time NBC listeners will know that I've often predicted that we would get new Switch hardware uh, mm -hmm. launching day and date with Breath of the Wild 2 this holiday season. Doesn't look like that's going to happen. And knowing Zelda's history of, of being delayed, I'm just hoping for an early 2022 release. You know, maybe they'll do a nice five-year uh, uh, wow. anniversary right. by you know launching Breath of the Wild 2 in the spring. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think that the trailer was really smart. Uh, it was very short. You know, it's only a minute and a half, and mm -hmm. the last 20 seconds of that trailer is just this shot of the castle floating above Hyrule. Um, but like you said, they showed off new powers. They showed off new enemies. They got enough in there that set the the lore dorks like myself ablaze <laughs> talking about like where in the timeline does this fall are we playing multiple timelines are we playing multiple characters what do these mm -hmm. things mean like i thought it was a really smart trailer for being as short as it was and yeah i, I mean my my hype level for this game continues to remain a 10 out of 10. So. do you have your own theories about what's going on um yeah, I subscribe to the Barrett Courtney rule of thought uh, for this one. Uh, uh, the guys over at Kind of Funny did a very great uh, explainer about uh, potentially playing as Ganondorf in this mm -hmm. this next one, and I would love to see something like that. Um, there's obvious ties to Skyward Sword. Uh, you know that I think that Nintendo is reissuing Skyward Sword in July for a reason. Um, now, Breath of the Wild, the original had ties to all you know references to all of the previous zelda games hidden tucked away some readily apparent and some you know kind of uh, uh deep cuts but this one specifically seems to be tied much more closely to skyward sword which is not my favorite zelda game but mm. i am interested to see how they tie those two worlds together yeah i mean that would make a lot of sense they have the uh, mm -hmm. skyward sword hd coming out next month yeah mm -hmm. uh miranda you since you work in guides does uh, the prospect of a sequel to Breath of the Wild, is that exciting or daunting to you? 
both. <laughs> What's that? Oh, both, both. Both, yeah. To be honest, like I didn't actually work on her Breath of the Wild guide. I, I only did a one page, and that was for fun. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was just like, oh, I'm having a good time. Like, I got to play it with my free time. So shout out to Brendan Graber, who did a, a lot of that guide and slayed it. Like, we seriously have such a beautiful guide for that. And I am looking forward to us having another beautiful guide for Breath of the Wild, too. Um, but honestly, I think there's such, um, or there was at least such a magic for Breath of the Wild, like, as part of discovery and finding cool things. And it felt like we kept digging into so many mysteries. But like, did you see this? Did you see that? Did you find this one character who said that thing? And and I'm really looking forward to getting that sense again. Mm -hmm. And I'm hoping it will. And I'm, I'm sure they will do that as well. So um, I'm very excited. <laughs> also, Link has sick long hair now, yeah. which yeah. is awesome. And a magic arm. Yeah. Now, uh, Metroid Dread was a huge surprise. Uh, that was a game that IGN was covering in the mid-2000s that I don't, I don't think many of us thought would ever see the light of day. But it's real. It's Metroid 5. It's the next game uh, in, canonically in the Metroid series, apparently concluding Samus' story. But Miranda, you said you're not really a Metroid fan. Or is, that, is that because you don't like Metroidvania-style games or just haven't played the Metroid series? I, I like Metroidvania style games. I just haven't played the Metroid series and I don't like side scrolling platformers. I've just really haven't mm. connected with them. I didn't really grow up with them. And so when it came to it, like, for example, when I think about the Mario games, my favorite are always the like more 3D adventure Mario's. Like, Mario 64 was my first Mario game. And that mm. was like, it was that. Then uh, Super Mario Sunshine, like, that's what I connected with. So. I was, I think, a little young to play Metroid when we did have, like, Nintendo consoles. And just seeing this, I'm like, oh, I'm really happy for everyone who's so excited to finally get to play this game. But looking at it, it's like, that's that's probably not something I would want to play. But mm. sure. that's okay. Lucy, how about you? Are you a Metroid fan? I am not, but uh, this looks really cool. I'm not, but just by virtue of I grew up in New Zealand, and uh, mm. Sega was the predominant console, and I had a... a a mega drive um mm -hmm. and just never really played some of those like iconic nintendo classics as a result um but you know this looks freaking cool and you know i was chatting to a colleague of ours cat bailey who wrote this uh video that we're watching right now uh and you know she said that she will be a guide uh for me through my first ever mm -hmm. metroid journey so nice. i'm I, i'm excited to play it for sure and you know, just by the virtue of the Switch being just the most accessible console uh, on the planet uh, in terms of just being able to, you know, pick it up and play it anywhere, uh, this is definitely going to be my first Metroid. That's exciting. Um, I think it's very cool that, you know, Nintendo's the only first-party platform holder that uh, used their E3 showcase to show off a brand-new 2D game in mm -hmm. one of their long-running <laughs> beloved franchises. Zach, I, I think you're probably excited for Metroid Dread. Damon, the hype <laughs> levels are off the charts, my man. I, look, I've recently come to a realization about myself. Uh, Metroidvania is the style of game that I like to play. Like, cool. outside of Zelda, Metroidvania is probably like the, the, the genre that I've spent the most time with. And specifically because of Metroid, I think it is such a criminally underrated franchise. Miranda, Lucy, totally understand your, your, uh, your uh, not necessarily avoidance, but like that you just haven't gotten into it. I think a lot of people haven't. And I will say, Metroid slaps. Check it out. Mm -hmm. um, but this game specifically... Like, not only was I so excited to see a 2D Metroid, but when the title card came up and it was revealed as Metroid Dread, I literally, like, stood up and threw my headphones off. Like, <laughs> Metroid Dread has been rumored since uh, uh, 2004 or 2005. Yeah. Um, there was, like, some very sneaky references in the Metroid Prime games to Dread. Like, it was... Sakamoto said in the, the Nintendo Treehouse interview that this game was canceled twice. Two times this game was canceled um, and came back from the grave. So I'm super, super stoked for this. Um, I also think that Metroid has such an incredible like backstory and lore um and this kind of picks up right where fusion left off and will mm -hmm. conclude the series um just like the zelda games the metroid games were released not in timeline order uh not canonical right like they're you know the games jump back and forth all over the timeline and this mm -hmm. one this one is at the very end of the timeline and will conclude samus's story with with metroid and like Man, I couldn't be more excited for this game. I'm so yeah. glad that it's coming out in October. I can't yep. believe that they waited until June to announce this. But we, you know, we've heard multiple rumors that this game has been done for a long time. So like, such a nice move of Nintendo and a smart move to hold this for a time when they're like, okay, we don't have a ton of games. 
but here's an excellent, you know, well, potentially excellent uh, uh, callback to, uh, you know, a, a long beloved franchise. So, sure. yeah, obviously I'm very excited about Metroid. But now, Zach, um, were you surprised that E3 came and went with no announcement of uh, Switch Pro? No, they told us they weren't going to talk about it. Um, th- you know, this is this is something that I feel like we it has been a big part of the conversation around mm-hmm. E3, and something that developers and publishers have been really uh, more actively participating in is is telegraphing, like, hey, here is what our conference is going to be about, or here is what our event is going to be about, because I think they're trying to avoid setting these lofty expectations and then having people get upset or or disappointed that those things aren't revealed. And Nintendo came out early and said, hey, we're going to be showing. Uh, primarily software, and it's going to be primarily software that is dropping in 2021. Uh, so don't expect to see, you know, uh, mm-hmm. anything beyond that. Do I think that the Switch Pro is uh, approaching uh, a, a release <laughs> or an announcement? Yes, definitely. I, I wouldn't be surprised if before the end of the year we see some announcement uh, about a Switch Pro. Um, but I was not surprised that we didn't see it at E3. Do you think it's out this year, or is it out next year with Breath of the Wild 2? I've, I've, I've said a lot that it would be day and date with Breath of the Wild 2, but it would probably make more sense to launch it around holiday. So mm-hmm. maybe by the end of this year. Well, there was also another significant Nintendo announcement that came out of Ubisoft, and that was Mario plus Rabbids Sparks of Hope. And I know Miranda is just super excited for that. <laughs> Loves a rabbit. Loves a good rabbit. Mm. Don't look at me. Don't talk to me. <laughs> the first game is really good. Miranda, I... Before the first Mario plus Rabbids, I, I agreed with you completely. I would have supported hunting Rabbids to extinction. But they, the game is so good, and they, they handled the Nintendo properties so well you know, that I've, I've softened on my feelings towards Rabbids. It's just such a shame that they're like, let's do a cool collaboration with Mario, but mm-hmm. then they stuck in the Rabbids. But Miranda, <laughs> like, I get it. But it's, I felt like, but I agree with Damon. Before this, this, the original game, I thought that rabbits were kind of like minions, just sort of ubiquitous yeah. and annoying. Mm-hmm. Um, but I loved the first game. And what we saw was so cool. And I'm so psyched for a second one. What, I mean, did you not enjoy the first game? Oh, I didn't play it. There's no <laughs> way. There's right. absolutely no way. And, like the thing is, these games could be one of the best games ever made. I'm not gonna play it. I'm, I'm just, I cannot stand the rabbits. I really can't. And like, I think sometimes you just have to draw a line, okay? They're just, just look at them. They're so awful to look at. Okay. Anyway, please, please continue. I know people do love them and that's fine. I, I just, I don't, I hate these stories. Oh gosh, okay, anyway, please go ahead. They're just, well, <sighs> I like the first game a lot. I like the style of game. I'm excited we're getting a sequel. Um, Lucy, another uh, big announcement around Summer of Gaming. Finally, Elden Ring finally mm-hmm. fully revealed. Uh, yeah. How's it look? How's it looking to you? Uh, this was my announcement of of the sort of whole you know event season. Uh, I think it looks just incredible. Um, I think that the the enemy designs, the world building, uh, the fact you know the lore that we're already we've already been told through our um, very very. Uh, incredible interview with Miyazaki. He was so giving with his answers. Um, you know, there's so much here to sort of sink our teeth into already. And it's kind of wild, you know, we've gone from a period where the Elden Ring subreddit was just making up their own lore because they yeah. had so they had nothing to go on. And now there's just so much to go on. There's so much information out there about this game already. Um, I, I love that they're putting an emphasis on uh, freedom, um, like there's there's sort of more ways in which to approach uh, boss battles. You can play more stealthily now. Um, there's a collectible element with uh, you know being able to summon enemies that you've defeated, uh, and and you know of course there's you know co-op returns as well. Um, but just look at this footage. I mean, again, I don't think there is anyone doing character and enemy design better than FromSoft. It was unlike anything else that we saw last week. Uh, I was blown away. It was better than I could have hoped. I, I tweeted out that it sort of looks like the, the, the only game I'll ever need. I know I'm being hyperbolic. I know I'm being hyperbolic, <laughs> but I, I was just, you know, I was, I was so excited for this game and this trailer and the subsequent interview with Miyazaki and the information that he gave us fulfilled every single one of my hopes. Wow. Uh, you're ma- you're making me excited for you, uh, Zach. Do you consider yourself a fan of the the Soulsborne games? 
big time. Yeah, I played all the the Souls games. Uh, some of them multiple times. I, I I couldn't be more excited for this. Shout out to my man Tam from Gamespot for absolutely losing his mind when this was announced. I was glad that we got at least something to look at because he's been just chomping at the bit for this uh, uh, this game for so long, and, and like many of us. And uh, yeah, uh, similarly, outside of Nintendo stuff, this was probably the announcement that got me the most excited um, because of the radio silence. Uh, mm-hmm. But man, yeah, I echo everything Lucy said. This game looks sick. I can't wait to play it. Um, I, I like what they're doing uh, with, with the spin on the Souls genre, as it's typically been. Um, uh, George R. R. Martin was out there saying some weird stuff last week, but that's okay. Well, you know, yeah. it's no big deal. Yeah, um, I'm I'm stoked for another FromSoft game. I'll play them all. Uh, I'm a big fan. And Miranda, how about you? Are these your kind of games? Yes, I do cool. enjoy them a ton. I love Dark Souls one and three. I skipped two, sorry. Um, mm. And Bloodborne is up next to me, so best I'm excited Ooh, to get into them. Yeah, Miranda! I'm very excited. I I'm know. I'm so excited for you to play Bloodborne. <laughs> yes, and so seeing this, it's just. I, I have to like pace myself, right? Because I know I'm going to adore Bloodborne. I'm just like, this is going to be a good time, yeah, is what yeah. I'm saying. I, I'm just also so relieved for all the people out there who are waiting for anything with Elden Ring. <laughs> I feel so bad because every time we have an event, we say like, oh, we have something to announce. They're like, oh my god, is it Elden Ring? Do you have Elden Ring? It's like, I'm so sorry. <laughs> but now we don't have to be sorry because we get uh, cool summoning horses, nice little speed, yeah. and uh, mm-hmm. Pokemon in Dark Souls. Yeah. Love it. I'm here for it. <laughs> Well, you have until January, I think, to uh, mm-hmm. get through Bloodborne when Elden Ring arrives. Plenty I time. would love to keep talking, and we will, right after a quick break. <laughs> when Games Group returns, we will be talking about PlayStation and what Sony's got on the horizon. IGN Summer of Gaming 2021 is presented by the Amazon original movie, The Tomorrow War, exclusively on Prime Video July 2nd, and powered by Duracell Optimum the official battery sponsor of Summer of Gaming 2021, and presented by USAA Insurance and Army National Guard. Pursue multiple paths while you serve. Reach your greatest potential with Army National Guard. Not only is IGN the world's biggest media brand for games and entertainment, but we also have a team of some of the world's biggest fans of your favorite franchises. From breaking news and exclusives, never before seen looks at movies and games, to reviews, let's plays, and live streams, IGN brings you all the coverage you need no matter where you are. Whether you're on IGN.com, the IGN app, YouTube, Facebook, or Snapchat, we've always got you covered. IGN, the number one source for all games and entertainment fans worldwide. In a world with non-stop news about Marvel, DC, Star Wars, you need a show with accurate reporting, hard-hitting commentary, and... Me, Akeem Lawanson, host of IGN's news show, The Fix Entertainment. Whether it's the latest superhero scoop, film fiasco, or anime announcement, I'll be here covering all the breaking movie, TV, and streaming news that matters most to you. Make sure to catch The Fix Entertainment on IGN for your fix of entertainment news. Let's drop it. If you're not following IGN on social media, what are you waiting for? We're constantly updating our feeds to bring you the latest news, gameplay, custom original content, the best user-generated videos and art, memes, and a whole lot more. Be part of the conversation throughout the year. Follow IGN on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, TikTok, and Snapchat. What's up everyone, Sydney here to bring you a little update about the future of IGN on YouTube. We've been listening to your feedback and it seems like some of you are more into games while others are more interested in movies and TV. So we got to thinking about it and decided, why not both? Our main channel will still bring you all the biggest news, reviews, previews, and trailers to keep you up to speed on the most important highlights. But if you only want games content 24 seven, head over to IGN Games. Movies and TV more your thing? Check out IGN Movies and TV. More channels, more of the stuff you love, more IGN.
Welcome back to Game Scoop Live. I'm Damon Hatfield, and with me are Miranda Sanchez, Lucy O'Brien, and Zach Ryan. Right now, we are talking PlayStation. In the midst of all of these E3 <laughs> announcements, PlayStation has been pretty quiet. Ratchet and Clank, Rift Apart has been very well received, mm -hmm. but we don't really know what to expect for the rest of the year and beyond. Horizon Forbidden West will hopefully be out sometime this year, and the God of War sequel got pushed to 2022. Lucy, what? Philip, what do you think? What is next for PlayStation and the PS5? Well, I think we need to stay to play. You know, like mm -hmm. if, if Sony is going to skip out on uh, E3 uh, and only show off Horizon Forbidden West prior to that really as the big kind of focus, I do think we need a more uh, well-rounded state of play to just remind PlayStation owners that there's stuff coming for them. Um, and, you know, we've certainly heard that there's stuff being made that hasn't been announced. So it would be very cool to just have a little bit more um, communication from Sony um, coming up in the in the next month or so. With all that said, I mean, I am so excited for, like, look at this footage, Horizon Forbidden West. I am mm -hmm. so, so excited. Do I believe it's going to come out this uh, this year? Mm -hmm. No, am <laughs> no. I being completely honest? Uh, you know, if no. I was a betting woman, which I'm not, uh, thankfully, um you know i would bet that this is going to be delayed i think that it is it, it you know it's i know it's been worked on for, for several years but it's so huge in scope and the communication around uh what they're aiming for in terms of release date has been very sort of loosey-goosey flexible um so i don't think we'll see it until next year uh god of war you know obviously has been pushed um i'm, I'm totally fine with both of these games being delayed um with that said, I you know I do think that if we're not seeing these big heavy hitter uh, sequels coming out this year, then again that's why we need more info as to what mm -hmm. you know we have to look forward to. I mean, Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart. I'm playing it right now. I'm having such a blast with it. It is just such a showcase of what the PlayStation Five can do. Um, and I just want you know I want to keep riding that hype train. I want some more stuff coming out for the for the PS Five. I want more PS Fives to be uh, out there in the <laughs> wild for people who want one. Um, you know, I, I think that there is uh, some work for Sony to do here. Um, mm -hmm. And I have all the faith in the world that, that we'll see some good stuff soon. I know you said you're not a betting woman, but if you were, would you bet there is a state of play coming soon? I would say yes. I have no insider info, uh, sure. but I, I, you know, I think um, from a, from a consumer friendly, consumer forward standpoint, I would say that that is definitely a smart move. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm fairly certain one will be coming soon. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, Ratchet and Clank, Rift Apart, big showcase, showcase for the PS5, almost universal acclaim from critics. I finished it a couple of nights ago. I think we're all playing it. I believe, Miranda, you just started it last night. Is that right? Yeah, just started last night, got it downloaded, um, and well, I was like, oh, I played through there, but I went a different way. That's okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, this is one of the early areas in the game. So what, what were your first impressions? Uh, it feels like I'm playing a Saturday morning cartoon that I just started mm -hmm. randomly, because like, I haven't played any Ratchet and Clank games before. My brother used to be really into them, so I have some familiarity with them. And it's just very old school in design and like how I think there's just a lot of boxes you destroy, then stuff goes everywhere, then it just collects, and <laughs> and yeah. then you just hit some enemies. Like it's it's very straightforward. Like there's not sure. a lot there as far as where I'm at. Like that's mm -hmm. complex, and like there's not a lot to do. And that's kind of a thing that bummed me out because it's like, oh, this looks like it's a first next gen game, and like I'm in this city area, and it's kind of just a lot of repeating things, like just the same robots over and over, and like kind of just the same screens and like. There's this one stall you can interact with, but everything else is like, oh, there's definitely a lot going on here, huh? Um, so I kind of wish there was a little bit more to do, but I know it's not supposed to be like this big open world where you're supposed to find everything, um, even though I, I think finding stuff is is fun to an extent. There's like those, oh, you, you don't have an upgrade to come up here yet. Um, and I am a little irritated with him keep yelling at me saying I have to go to the nightclub. And I'm like, Ratchet, I do not want to go to the nightclub yet. I want to go get you some upgrades. So, yeah. uh, but those little complaints aside like I, I am having a fun time with it i feel a little fun guy he's just like this little mm -hmm. mushroom dude who shoots stuff and he helps me in battle i like that <laughs> so I, i'm interested in that. i'll definitely keep with it it's a pretty game for sure and it's nice to have like that sh that graphical showcase right like mm -hmm. i think we've been sort of waiting for those games to come out like with halo we're just like hey guys <laughs> uh master chief is not launching with ray tracing what <laughs> does, yeah. does he not deserve ray tracing and so it's like you of course they delayed the game um, and this is kind of, I felt like my first foray into a 
big next gen sort of showcase for those graphics and like the ray tracing and just pretty particles. And, and that's what I've been enjoying a lot in this so far. Yeah, it is nice to have a, a graphical showcase that's a PS5 exclusive. Um, but of course, both Horizon Forbidden West and God of War are going to be cross-gen games, uh, both PS4 and PS5. Whereas coming out of the Microsoft showcase, they revealed a lot of games that are just Series X exclusive, like Starfield and, and Redfall. So Lucy, does that concern you? Do you, do you, do you worry about the PlayStation 5 sort of being able to keep up with these uh, these games that are going to be Series X exclusives? I mean, I understand the argument on both sides. I understand that people are disappointed, um, you know, based on a, on a theory that there might be cut corners, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and sort of uh, n essentially downgrading uh, these sure. PS5 experiences. But I, I'm not worried. I don't think, uh, you know, we're looking at this footage of, from Horizon Forbidden West. I don't think this looks downgraded at all. I think it looks absolutely beautiful. And I think that the proof is in the footage, right? Like mm -hmm. if it looked like a last gen game, if it looked, uh, you know, like it was playing on a PlayStation 4, yeah, I'd be, you know, I'd be asking questions. But look at the, you know, look at this. This is a PS5 game. And I don't think that Sony is in any hurry to downplay exactly what the PS5 is capable of. Um, you know, I, I don't think that Horizon Forbidden West is going to be anything less than a graphical showcase. Um, and I'm pleased ultimately that PS4 owners, of which there are so many, there is such a huge use base you. there, yeah. um, are going to be able to play to you know play these games as well, uh, especially while the PS5 is still in such uh, scarce supply, and God knows how how long that's going to last. Um, so. You know, that's my personal opinion. I can see it from the other side as well, but uh, I, I personally think that it's a good thing. Um, and uh, right now, it's a good thing. You know, if, if the if the sort of vague cross generation uh, continues, then I'll be asking questions. But uh, right now, I think that it's a smart move. Mm -hmm. Now, Zach, uh, Horizon Zero Dawn and Breath of the Wild are are often compared to each other, perhaps mm -hmm. unfairly, but they came out so close to one another mm -hmm. in both open world games. So we know you're very excited for Breath of the Wild 2. How would you sort of rate your uh, excitement for Forbidden West? Oh, uh, yeah, we were talking about this a little bit before the show. Not a huge Horizon fan, didn't mm -hmm. really do it for me. Uh, this game certainly looks absolutely gorgeous and I will play it because I'm interested in seeing what any Sony first party studio has to offer. Um, also, I think, you know, like uh, my impression of the first game was it's a it's a kind of a tired comparison, but I think it, it definitely could uh, benefit from sort of the Assassin's Creed to Assassin's Creed Two kind of jump, where the first game was mm -hmm. fine, and I think the second game could be something really magical. So um, I, I would say I'm medium hyped for this game. <laughs> yeah, I mm -hmm. I agree that it what we're seeing certainly looks beautiful. Um, mm -hmm. I hope they I hope it, this one feels a little bit less restrictive in your exploration. That yeah. was one of one of my uh, criticisms of the first game. But thinking about God of War, we don't really know much of anything about. We haven't, you know, what what that game is. We haven't even seen any sort of gameplay footage. So, Lucy, what are what are sort of your your hopes and dreams for what the God of War sequel is when it when it arrives next year? Oh God! Well, I thought that the you know the was it 2019 that the God of War came out, or was it 2018? 2018. 2018. 2018. Um, you know, I thought that game was close to perfect. Uh, so, you know, for me, I'm just more interested in the story side of things. Like there's, there's not a huge amount I would suggest, uh, in terms of gameplay changes. I thought that game felt so good to play. Um, <laughs> God, it was like a drug playing that thing. Um, but you know, I, am, wow. I am so invested in, in this story and I know that, uh, Santa Monica, uh, is, you know, they're very, very talented storytellers. So I just want to see another game that touches you know those sorts of unexpected emotional highs of of the 2018 mm. game and mm. i I'm, I'm really really excited to see more we've got nothing but this logo which i feel i've seen <laughs> so much i'm like dreaming of it now um but yeah for, for for my money it's all about the story and and delving deeper into these characters mm -hmm. i'm super excited for the sequel whatever it turns up being 20 god of war was my favorite game of 2018. It was also mm -hmm. a year that it had to compete with Red Dead Redemption 2. Mm -hmm. um, there are a couple other big announcements over Summer of Gaming and E3 that we could, we could hit on before we run out of time. Ubisoft's one more thing from its conference was Avatar, 
which was a little surprising to me, although what we saw looked very, very pretty. Uh, I guess I just, I, I guess as we were talking yesterday, Maybe there are more Avatar fans out there than I'm aware of. <laughs> mm-hmm. It has to be. I think that would Certainly, be the case, yeah. considering yeah. its uh, placement on the worldwide box office, Damon. Well, yeah, yeah, I know that it was it brought back into theaters, and yeah. yeah. Did, but isn't it like we all win because it's like this is the 3D experience of a lifetime? We're like, it's all right, I'll, I'll bite. I'll go see what this is about, and then we're like, oh, okay. I mean, that's how yeah. I felt anyway. I was like, that was a really long movie. And it was kind of like Pocahontas. I've heard comparisons yeah. to Fern Gully. It's like, I've seen this story before. It's just really blue. I, I think that uh, <laughs> I think that Massive is a tremendously talented developer. That's um, true. I think that they've done some really interesting things with, uh, uh, you know, like the Division and the Division 2. And th- that DLC was really impressive. Uh, they're... Clearly, there's been some work being done on this game for a long time. Like, we knew that this game was in development uh, since, well, at least they confirmed last last fall um i thought it was really awesome to see this and we've gotten more words since this trailer dropped that it is going to be like a first person open world adventure which is, is exciting i'm not a huge avatar fan myself um but this game does look like it's doing some interesting stuff and i think honestly like taking a, a sort of far cry example and putting that in kind of a foreign alien world and letting you do a bunch of weird stuff with weird critters yeah i think could be really cool um, I, i'm see, also really I think- excited for I'm also really excited for Massive to take on the Star Wars mantle. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. we knew that they're developing something there, and that uh, their work on the Avatar game helped them secure whatever they're going to do with Star Wars. So, whatever Disney saw in them, based on this uh, this game, is obviously pretty promising. I was just going to say, Zach, I think it's going to be a game as a service for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, Which, I Star think Wars or this one? This one, Avatar. Okay. I think what's going to happen is they're going to time it uh, just before you know the first movie drops, and as the subsequent movies, I've completely forgotten how many there are because they've five. all been, there they've just been like Avatar so movies. many announced. <laughs> yeah. Um, as every movie drops, you know there'll be more added to the game, and it will be a um, an ongoing game. That is that is my belief uh, in 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 this game anyway. That it is definitely going to be a game as a service, See, which is you I, know Ubisoft's mo right now. It's true. I, I yeah, they did say that they were leaning more into uh, uh, games of service last year. Um, I, I don't know. I disagree. I think that Star Wars will be massive games of service game. I think that we'll probably see that as a more expansive uh, ongoing game, and this might be a standalone thing because honestly, they could probably cash in a few times as these movies drop. You know, we know that this game takes place on the other side of Pandora and, and is focused on a different set of uh, characters from the film. So um, I think that they could come back to this pool a couple of times throughout the course of the next however many decades it takes for these movies to drop. So, Let's make sure. a bit. Okay. But you just said you were not a betting not a woman bit. in the previous segment. So I've changed my mind break, in the course of this podcast. Your own rules. Yeah. <laughs> the game scoop has led Lucy to gambling. That's right. Um, <laughs> speaking of and aliens, drugs. <laughs> yeah, yes, that's right. <laughs> and drugs, a lot of vices. Uh, mm-hmm. Speaking of alien worlds, one of the pleasant surprises of E3 for me was Guardians of the Galaxy um, from Square Enix in uh, IDOS, Montreal. I think this game looks really cool. Uh, pleasantly surprised, and that's someone uh, that's coming from someone who's a little bit disappointed with Marvel's Avengers. But I like that they're just sticking to single player game playing as one character although i also understand there's disappointment that people can't you know choose characters since the guardians are a very diverse group of superheroes but i think they kind of get the characters for the most part i think the jokes were landing for the most part i like the alien design the the creatures and these interesting worlds that we're going to be visiting uh miranda did this one do anything anything for you uh guardians is definitely one of my i guess higher tier marvel franchises my my big problem with this Star Lord's hair. Well, this yeah. guy is from the yeah. 80s. This yeah. guy loves the 80s. That hair's not 80s, man. <laughs> it's not 80s. But we got Groot. So I don't care. I'm happy. <laughs> I just love Groot. Yeah. I, I don't know. I like this team a lot. They're very quirky. And and Damon, as you said, like they did a good job on selling the humor. I think that's just such an important part of Guardians. And if you don't get that right, then it's not Guardians. So yeah. Um, yeah. I think it looks neat. I got um, heavy Mass Effect vibes, you know, mm-hmm. like you, the, obviously your choices are going to carry over. Um, heavy Telltale vibes, you mm-hmm. know, we saw that sequence of uh, Rocket Raccoon being thrown across the chasm and then it said Rocket is like very angry about this, which I think, you know, I, I think that's really interesting. And, and I can't discount IDOS Montreal as a developer. Both of those Deus Ex games are phenomenal. Um, I'm really excited to see what they do with the Guardians. Uh, this game to me looks solid. I'm not like, yeah. like, 
over the roof, over the moon hyped for it, but it's definitely something that I want to check out because like Miranda, Guardians is one of my favorite Marvel things ever. So, Yeah, well, it's coming in October and there's actually mm-hmm. going to be a lot to play in October. So I don't, I don't know if I'll get to it day one because October has Metroid Dread, Far Cry mm-hmm. 6, Back for Blood. Um, but I'm excited for Guardians. Uh, Lucy, did the, did the reveal do anything for you? Yeah, I mean, for me, it was all about the writing. Um, the game itself looks like perfectly fine, um, but the writing was so exceptional in this trailer. Uh, the narrative designer, lead narrative designer in this game is Mary uh, DeMarle, who also wrote uh, Deus Ex Human Revolution. Um, <laughs> and I think that everything we saw in this trailer was just pitch perfect in terms of the characters that, you know, we've grown to love over the course of the MCU um, and you know, sort of character models, not, notwithstanding. Um, but yeah, the jokes I, I found, I found this trailer funny. Like I sort of mm-hmm. had a little bit of a genuine laugh out loud moment a, a couple little, of times. Did you do a little chuckle? That little chuckle, little <laughs> yeah. chuckle. Um, it was, it was great. The tone was, was absolutely perfect. And for me, that's what guardians of the galaxy is all about is getting those characters, right. If you get them even a little bit off, it's like, mm-hmm. it's just, it's cringy. Right. And, and, mm-hmm. and for me, this was just all bang on. So I'm very excited for this game for that reason. Mm-hmm. Well, my friends, that is all the time we have today, but thanks to my guests. Thanks to everyone who tuned in at home to watch us live. IGN's summer of gaming continues with our pride stream on Friday, the EA play event on July 22nd. Hopefully it'll be some dead space there. And Gamescom on deck for August. You can catch all of our coverage on those events and everything that pops up in between over at IGN.com, on YouTube, across social media, or even on your smart TV. Check IGN for a full schedule. Thanks again. My name's Damon Hatfield. GameScoop is out. So long, everybody. Until next time. IGN Summer of Gaming 2021 is presented by USAA Insurance and Army National Guard. Pursue multiple paths while you serve. Reach your greatest potential with Army National Guard. And by the Amazon original movie, The Tomorrow War, exclusively on Prime Video July 2nd. And powered by Duracell Optimum, the official battery sponsor of Summer of Gaming 2021. If you're not following IGN on social media, what are you waiting for? We're constantly updating our feeds to bring you the latest news, gameplay, custom original content, the best user-generated videos and art, memes, and a whole lot more. Be part of the conversation throughout the year. Follow IGN on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, TikTok, and Snapchat. with non-stop news about Marvel, DC, Star Wars, you need a show with accurate reporting, hard-hitting commentary, and me, Akeem Lawanson, host of IGN's news show, The Fix Entertainment. Whether it's the latest superhero scoop, film fiasco, or anime announcement, I'll be here covering all the breaking movie, TV, and streaming news that matters most to you. Make sure to catch The Fix Entertainment on IGN for your fix of entertainment news. Let's drop it. Competition brings out the best in all of us. Well, mostly. Oh, that's a controller break. That's unfortunate. Welcome to IGN Compete, where we bring you the stories behind the esports headlines. From the triumphs, Daryl takes the game to the hardships, is not happy. to the miracle moments that will go down in history. Hey, oh, I just can't believe it. It's crazy. It's all here on IGN Compete. Out of disbelief.